Pros. I'm here with Brian, and we're digging into VRB startup. So we're in our uh, our live lab that we have at Mechanical Resource Group, and we're going to be looking at doing startup on VRB four. Mm -hmm. Brian, so tell me about what makes a successful VRB startup. The first and foremost thing with uh, VRB startups, any startup, but VRB in particular, is communication between the installing contractor and the company that's coming out to do a startup because these guys are a little different animal. It's a lot of steps to follow. So the, the communication is key to make sure it's ready to start when you get there. Everything has been installed properly and you're gonna have a successful startup. So the first thing I'll talk about just real quick, few bullet points, things you'd expect to see before you arrive typically is the shipping brackets removed from the compressors. We've got two compressors in this unit. Each compressor has two shipping brackets, three feet, two brackets. So you get three bolts on each compressor, only two brackets on each one. Take a half inch socket with an extension. Um, lesson learned over the years, use a very long extension. That way you don't bust your knuckles up when you're getting those shipping brackets off. Again, hopefully that's done by the installing contractor, but not that big of a deal. We're not gonna walk off the job, nor should anyone else for something like that. Just make sure the brackets are out so the compressor doesn't get damaged. Next thing to do is to make sure the service valves in this condenser are completely closed. The reason we wanna do that, so you get it out of the box, sits on the ground, these service valves need to be closed. The condenser is charged with refrigerant. So because we pressure test all of our piping up to 550 PSI with nitrogen, if one of these valves wasn't seated closed properly, we would introduce nitrogen into the condenser and then we'd have non-condensables in a refrigerant. So seems like an easy thing, but that can really get you. So just make sure your service valves are closed before you start installing your piping. Next thing to do is after all the piping has been run out, we need to take accurate measurements of our liquid line. We do that so we can calculate a refrigerant charge. As I stated, there is refrigerant in the condensers, but that's just gas for the condenser. This piping can go thousands of feet, multiple indoor units, so we need to measure all that so we make sure we have a complete refrigerant charge in the system when we start it. Best time to do that is when the installing contractor is laying the pipe out again. Another reason for good communication, because once, as you can see, this piping is insulated, you're not gonna be able to tell what the diameter on the pipe is, so if it goes from a seven eighths liquid to a half inch, you're not gonna know by looking, you can't look through the insulation, right? So a lot of work goes on the back end if that hadn't been done uh -huh. for you. So that's a big one. That one gets missed a lot, goes I, back to communication. I'd probably just add one more thing of, of uh, verifying that the piping installed matches Absolutely. the the plants and the uh, and the BRV Express piping that's right. layout as that's well. That's a good point, yeah. John. So we when these systems get sold, they get provided with a piping express form, which is basically a diagram that shows you how to run the pipe, how long and what sizes. We do need to verify that when we do a startup to make sure those uh, practices have been followed. If we're getting bad information on our liquid line measurements, um, you're not gonna have a good startup. The unit may start and run and, and you might think it's fine. A couple months down the road, peak seasons, you start having issues. Could be undercharged, which can lead to component failures, get the system dirty and now you're just, it's snowballing yeah. out of control on you. Super critical to make sure that's been provided to us and then also to go spot check. Get in the building, if the ceiling tiles are in, we're just gonna have to get a ladder out, get above ceiling and, and just do some quick spot checks based off what they gave us. Obviously you can't go measure every inch of it, but visually go look at everything and make sure it's laid out right, make sure we don't have any oil traps in the piping. Things like that all need to be verified at startup. If we wash all our oil out of our compressor and it's hundreds of feet down in a big oil trap somewhere, the unit's gonna keep running and you're gonna lose compressors. And again, it'll continue to snowball on you. So very important for the piping length to be accurate and installed correctly. Um, after that point, and we know it's installed right, our piping looks good. After we've pressurized it to 550 and it's passed pressure test, then we pull our vacuum on all of our line set and make sure we do a triple vac down to 500 microns. So really quick, um, why triple vacuum is important on new installations, particularly when you got a lot of pipe in your building, it's not all, all gonna get installed in one day. So that piping may be open to the atmosphere for a few days. You may get moisture, just humidity in the air gets in the piping. If you pull your vacuum too quickly, it'll crystallize that moisture. You'll never know it, you'll pull a good vacuum, but as soon as you put refrigerant in it, it comes out of that vacuum, your moisture comes back to a liquid state 
and now it's in your refrigerant and you got a dirty system. So triple vacuum, which is pull it down to 2,500, change your vacuum, pump oil, put two pounds of nitrogen, bleed it off, pull it again, and then pull it a third time. And then you know you can have froze any moisture in there. You've got a good vacuum. How long do you need to hold it at 500? You need to hold it at least an hour. Okay. Below 500. Now you may get to 250 and it may raise up to 400 in an hour, you're still okay. If it goes over 500 within an hour, you've either got moisture in it or you might yeah. have a leak somewhere. So vacuum, super critical. Piping length measurement, super critical. All because we gotta make sure we got the right amount of refrigerant, we got a good vacuum, it's clean, dry system, and our piping, we're not gonna have issues down the road with that. After that's been done, um, next step really is to use that vacuum to pull in as much of the calculated refrigerant charge from our liquid line measurement that we got. Now, what we do in the field, we have the contractor provide that to us, and then we'll do the calculation ourselves. It is something you can do yeah. yourself. There's Daikin has some really good service apps out there that'll do the calculation for you. It's not that difficult, but you know, if contractors don't have to get time to get to it, maybe they've got a, not got a guy familiar with how to do that. Really no big deal to make that up. So we'll do the calculation for them if needed. And then we want to use the vacuum on the line set to pull as much of that additional charge in as we can. And when it stops and we can't get any more gas in it, say it takes 50 and the vacuum pulled 30 pounds in. Then we'll go ahead and open up our service valves and move on to the next step of startup. But very critical, let that vacuum pull in as mm -hmm. much of that gas in a liquid state as yeah. you possibly can. Now we've got our gas in as much as we can, but we're not quite ready to start the unit yet because we haven't turned power on anything. It's another very critical thing with Daikin startups is on Daikin indoor units and branch selector boxes, when you turn the power on to them, all the valves in the units go closed. So you're not gonna be able to pull a good vacuum. You're never gonna know that. Right, so that's another reason why you want to communicate with your contractor. Electrician wants to check his work. He wants to turn things on. As soon as he turns power onto that indoor unit, now the valves are closed. You think you're pulling a good vacuum out here, but you're really not. So another thing critical to go around and check, make sure nothing's powered up before you start all that. So a lot of work on the front end. You really want that to be done by others, but you know everybody's doing as best they can, but you really need to spot check and make sure that's been done. So power everything up inside after we've got our gas in there. Power up our condenser. This guy needs to be on for at least six hours for the crankcase heaters to heat up enough to make sure we've boiled all the refrigerant off out of the oil. Yeah. So first day, a lot of spot checking, a lot of verifying, getting power turned on. Really not going to start it because you got to have six hours unless you can get there really early and get it, get it turned on pretty quick, you know. What if it's 110 degrees outside? Per Daikin, six hours. Okay. I get that question all the time. Yeah. I mean, we do, it is a very hot climate, but per the book, mm -hmm. six hours. Yeah. Now it helped. They used to say 24 hours, 10 years ago, and they right. dropped it to six. So maybe another few years we'll be down to an hour. I don't know, but yeah. they, they have backed off a bit, but they still pretty hold tight to that six hours. Um, next step on that, after we've got all our power turned on at our indoor units, then we're going to come out to our outdoor unit. Everything's powered up. We need to know how many indoor units are connected to this unit and how many branch selector boxes are connected. And the reason for that, say we had 10 indoor units, we got power turned on to nine of them. But if we don't know how many indoor units it has, we're gonna assume it only has nine. But something's not been turned on, so now our charge is off. It, the unit will still start because it's only talking to nine units, but you got a unit out there that hadn't been turned on yet. So. We find out how many there are, and then we can come to this unit and just by uh, opening this little window right here, it exposes the printed circuit board of the unit. And there's a few little buttons in there and by manipulating these buttons, I can go through and this condenser will tell me what it's talking to. So if I've got 10 indoor units and five branch selector boxes, by pushing these buttons, it's gonna display that and tell me I've got 10 indoor units and five, and now I know, okay, I'm ready to move on to the next step. It sees everything it's got, which is basically uh, running it through test operation mode. Again, initiated through the printed circuit board. When we run it through test operation, what it's doing is it's ramping up all the compressors. It's speeding the fans up out here. It's turning the indoor units on. It's opening expansion valves on the indoor units. It's trying to verify deltas across the evaporator coils to make sure the refrigerant charge is adequate. If you had say half of the charge in this unit it should have, it will not pass test operation. You'll get a fault. And when you go through your, your 
fault code troubleshooting is going to lead you back to short of charge. So very important to have everything turned on, to have the right charge in it before you go into test operation. One other thing I should probably mention before test operation, make sure all your condensate drain lines are connected in your indoor unit because it's going to keep running and it's, it could maybe take 45 minutes to do this. And when it runs in test operation, it's in full cool mode. So if you've got a hot building, and they didn't connect condensate drain lines, you're gonna be flooding water inside the building there. So very important to make sure those drain really lines good are story. connected. Yeah. It's a lot, yeah, you see it happens a lot. That's another thing, it's all about communication because you're visually spot checking, maybe they didn't glue it. it it's, it's there, but it's not glued, you know, it's just so many people are critical to making sure these startups go smooth from the company that sells the product to the installing contractor to the guys out there starting it. We've all got to work together and communicate to each other to make sure we get a successful startup on these. Hey, Brian, tell me mm -hmm. this. Can you see from the condensing, the outdoor unit, mm -hmm. can you see uh, any expansion valve or indoor unit expansion valve or um, status information of from the outside? indoor unit from mm -hmm. the condenser? Not without software. When we connect our service checker software to our indoor or outdoor unit, we can see some things like that. Um, but just from interfacing with the printed circuit board, I can't see anything other than than how many units it's talking to. I can put indoor units into like a forced fan mode, you know, say I knew it had 10 and only counted nine. I can come out here and put it in a mode that turns all the units it's talking to the high speed fan and then I can walk around the building and find the one that's not running and know, okay, there here's, we don't have power, something's going on, this unit's not working. Yeah. That's kind of about as much as I can do to the indoor units from out here without having software to connect. Okay. If we have the service checker tool, we can see all that. Yeah, so that leads me to my next question. So I know you have to address each indoor unit and, and basically bind it to the outdoor unit, mm -hmm. right? Is that, is that correct? No, no, well, we do address indoor units, but it's for service checker. Okay. Or I touch so manager. That was leading to my question. Do you yep. have to address them? Would you need to address the indoor units if you were trying to use your, your uh, service checker during startup? You don't have to, but it makes it, it's better if you do it because if you set an address to it and you can keep notes and you can say, okay, I've set this unit to address number one. Now, when I fire up my service checker and I see it shows unit number one, I'll know, oh, that's the lobby unit in there. Cause so yeah, if you address them and you take good notes, when you connect your software to it and look at it, you'll see, cause it'll just come up as AirNet one. Mm -hmm. And it's up to you to know what unit was AirNet one. So okay. yeah, if you got great records, absolutely. We always want to AirNet stuff, even if it doesn't have a centralized control. Yeah, tell me what AirNet is. So AirNet is basically when you're communicating with the service checker tool. Okay. Because we don't know, hopefully it's us coming back, but if it's not, we don't want to do that to the next contractor, set up an AirNet address. So that way when they plug in, they'll see it's got AirNet addresses we like to try to leave a little cheat sheet in the condenser somewhere that gives that information. Well, to, the main thing you want to do anytime you do a startup on new equipment is you do set AirNet addresses, we do set group addresses, and you want to make a copy of that and leave it on site with the GM. So they can put it in their records, they can hand it off to the customer at the end of the job. Five years down the road, somebody mm -hmm. else comes along, hopefully that information is still yeah. there. It, it is critical to address, for yeah. sure. That's good, good information. And uh, tell me this, uh, when it comes to charging it mm -hmm. and putting final charge in, yep. uh, are you always weighing that out? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, so we'll weigh that. So say we knew it took 50 pounds, the vacuum pulled 30 pounds in. This unit has what's called a manual charge mode, which is exactly what it says. You go into the printed circuit board, manipulate it through the buttons. It starts the compressor, starts ramping it up, and it starts pulling the gas in. So at that time, I'd want it set up on my scales mm -hmm. so I can see how much gas I'm pulling out. Now, manual charge mode, is it does it's not the fastest thing in the world. So Inficon scales, for sure, I know will do this. After 30 or 45 minutes, they shut off. So good idea to just zero or do something to the scale. Just push a button to light up to make sure your scale doesn't shut off. Maybe you're 15 pounds in, you walk off for five minutes and you come back, your scale's turned off. So yeah. very critical to weigh it in and make sure you're aware of it because yeah. it's happened to me before. It happened to, it's, I'm sure it's happened yeah. to everybody. Yeah, that'd be Or your battery dies in your scales. It's so critical to make sure you got a good set of accurate scales that aren't going to turn off on you if you're putting a lot of gas in the system. Okay, you, you get your final, mm -hmm. you get your mm -hmm. final yep. uh, refrigerant charge. Uh, I know you guys typically will write that charge on the, on the unit on the panel, uh -huh. right? That's right. Yep. Okay. On the back side of this panel is a sticker that comes in the packet with the unit and it's laid out for you to put 
if you it's even got spaces to put your liquid line measurements which are great if you got that so like i said down the road you know how many years somebody comes back and they flip that control panel over they can see all of their piping lengths they can see what the additional charge added to the unit was and what the total charge is because i may have three condensers piped together each of them may hold between 17 and 22 pounds plus all the refrigerant out in my piping. So if for some reason that sticker's not on there and somebody's doing a startup, use a Sharpie, something like that. Always better to put it on the inside. You know, this is covered, but maybe the panel gets left off for a while. UV fades out of Sharpie really quick. So I always like to put it on the back side of that control panel. So when somebody opens it, maybe they're just doing a basic PM on the unit, but they'll open it and they'll see that and they'll know that's what the charge is. So very critical to put that. Unfortunately, that is in this world. That packet, usually you see, still see it in the bottom of the unit. It never mm -hmm. gets opened. Yeah. But in the packet that ships with the unit is that document, peel off clear sticker that's made to go on the back side of that panel. So you can put all that information down on there. Yeah, that's good. Brian, I'd, I'd, I'd say that BRV is, is probably the most efficient, most technological piece of, a, a piece of gear we probably provide. And yeah. it's, it's probably the most comfortable and can do amazing things but it's a different animal when it comes to startup. And there's a lot yeah. to know. There's a lot of things that you can mess up and there's a lot of things you need to know just from experience standpoint. I know we, we provide uh, startup and commissioning mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. How important is it that uh, contractors are going through that class and are familiar with it yeah. and, uh, and, and get them indoctrinated into the BRB or BRF yeah. world? I'll say, you know, from my point of view, coming over here to MRG, I'd never seen VRV before. I had no business working. I thought I knew, but I mm -hmm. didn't know. So it's so critical to go through training. You don't, you don't have to go through all the technical training, but there are so many steps to follow to have a successful install and startup. And it's all procedure and steps. It's really not rocket science. You mm -hmm. just have to go from A to Z. And if you do that, it's, it's going to be a great system run for years with no issues. It really does. If you skip one of those, especially with the piping and the refrigerant and the purging while you braze, it's, yeah. and, and it's just a matter of months you'll start having issues. And they are technical and there's a lot of obviously moving parts and pieces in there. There's a lot of little strainers and screens that can get stopped up all from a, a dirty system or a bad install. So it's critical. It yeah. really is critical but it's a rock solid piece of gear. Yeah, when, when you do it right, you don't have problems. Yep. When it's not right, specifically the piping, you might think it's gonna get better, but it never gets better until you it, fix it. It never gets better. And if, it's, if you've just had guys changing compressors, change, man, it just really starts to yeah, get out of control. You can destroy a system. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And all that money, all that yep. time, all that energy spent, can be for not if yep. you don't just follow the steps or pick up the phone if you don't know yeah i like to say you know like i wouldn't go out and buy a lamborghini and then take it to valvoline to get the oil change you know you, if you're putting that kind of money in a top notch piece of gear you want to do it right you want to yeah. do follow all the steps and then it's it's going to be good the rest of the way yeah can't wait to ride in your lamborghini yeah, was, yeah. this is my next service truck i awesome. told you yet. yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right. But, uh, Anything else we need to know? Um, duct work insulated, all the refrigerant piping insulated. You know, um, when I was talking about test operation, I, I had some issues with the contractor before, wanted me to start one and his piping wasn't insulated. And it's, I really struggled explaining that to him that this thing needs to see refrigerant piping a certain, it needs to be the same temperature when it leaves here and it gets to the unit within a couple degrees. But if it's not got insulation on, it's a huge difference. So just the little things like that, that you may be able to, if you're doing just a regular split system, I can do that later. You, you can't do it later on this stuff. Yeah. It has to be done by the book. Uh, from A to Z again. It has no old traps, right piping stuff. If you've got big long runs of piping, you need to put expansion loops in there. All stuff we cover in our training extensively and we hammer it home because yeah. we've seen it so many times, you know, yeah. the difference between a good one and a bad one. How much time do you spend inside versus outside during a startup? 50-50 maybe. Yeah. You're a lot of time, you're on the roof doing stuff up here, um, you know, I'd love to say everyone you walk up to, you don't have issues, but you know, com wires being landed in the wrong place, very common. You know, last thing you wanna do is just throw your hands up at a contractor and say, figure it out. You wanna stay there and try to help the guys out. So a lot of time you're, you might be sorting through com wire, maybe, you know, something's wrong with the power, you're helping them out there. If it were truly ready to go, as soon as you got there, you might be on the roof three or four hours inside the building 
four to five, something like that. Mm -hmm. Biggest thing when you're done with it, as anything else, you want to test it in the heat and cool mode. Um, so switch it over to cooling mode, walk through, check all your units, take an infrared gun, shoot your temp difference, make sure everything's cooling like it should. And then you got to do the same thing in heat. What we've seen in these heat recovery units, which when you got three pipes, a suction, a mixed gas, and a liquid, if something gets crossed up, when it goes through test operation mode, like I said, it runs in full cool mode, you won't catch those cross pipes when it switches in the heating modes when you'll catch it. Mm -hmm. The caveat with this is above 82.4 degrees ambient, this guy will not go into the heat mode. So if you're starting one of these up in the summer, good idea to come back the next morning and just switch it over to heat let it run for a couple hours, run in, check everything out, make sure it's good to go. This time of year, it's gonna be, we don't have too many hours it's where it's below quick. 82. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. What else we you do? Um, like I said, communicate with your general contractor, leave all your literature when you're done with the job with them at the job trailer, communicate, let them know it's there because that's critical to have down the road, a couple years down the road when everybody's left and the customer's there by himself and he's he needs that, he's gotta have it. That's that's who we're there to serve. So make sure we mm -hmm. take care of the customer. Unit's clean and nice, piping supported as it should be, insulated all the way out. All your drains are connected, all your nav stats, your thermostats are connected and working. There are field settings you may wanna come put back in this unit. If we were installing it inside a mechanical room, we would be ducting the condenser air out of it. So we'd have to increase some settings, which increase the condenser fan speed. So there are some field settings in the condenser we may or may not need to set based off installation uh, as well as indoor units there's everything's a little different with the indoor unit and but what it's going to need to do and how it's going to need to be controlled so you may have to do some field settings inside so uh, yeah there's a lot that goes into startup on these guys once you do a few of them you get really comfortable with it and again it's it's following the process and the procedure and the steps and go into training and, and ask if, questions if you're a project manager and you go to the training and the installers don't make sure you are on the job with them. We see that a lot, you know, guys get busy, they send the PM, then he gets pulled on another job. Installers haven't necessarily been to the same level of training and that can cause a little bit of confusion. So mm -hmm. in a perfect world, you got your, your lead installer there at yeah. training. That's, that's the best way to do it. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, appreciate the feedback. No Always problem. great to be with yep. you. Thanks for coming out again. Um, hey, hit that like, hit that subscribe, and uh, if you guys want some more uh, content or something specific, please hit it in the comments and we'll try to get it for you. Um, and check us out next time on Mechanical Pros.